Hey class. All right, we're back to discuss Fanny Fern and the reading of hers that we will study for classes called Blackwell's Island number three. Now, Fanny Fern is another extremely interesting case um, for the 1800s, very non-traditional. Um, if you look at the written out lecture, there is a photo of Fanny Fern, kind of neat to see what she actually looks like or looked like, I should say. Um, and there are a couple different websites that you could check out if you'd like more information on her with biographical and literary information, both. Um, and there's even a fannyfern.org site, right? So um, you can check that out, devoted to all of Fanny Fern. Uh, there's even a recording of one of Fanny Fern's other works um, on YouTube. And, and that's a recording of an audio book of um, her 1854 autobiographical novel called Ruth Hall. So basically, she uses herself as the protagonist. She changes the names, but uses many, many, many details from her own life um, as the character of Ruth Hall. So that's kind of fun if you want to know more about Fanny Fern's life to uh, listen to that audiobook. A lot of times, I I mean, I love audiobooks because I can just like put them on while I'm doing, you know, boring chores around my house, like laundry, folding laundry, cleaning up messes, doing the dishes, uh, mowing the grass, you know, things like that, that are kind of tedious that you really don't have to think about. So you put something else on to listen to so that you're getting your mind stimulated at the same time. Anyway, that's that's a fun way to learn a little bit more about Fanny Fern's life. Although, since it's, you know, an autobiographical novel, a novel means it's a work of fiction. So you can't, like, expect everything to be accurate in that. But she did use her own life as inspiration for that, for that novel. All right. Well, Fanny Fern is from America. She lived in the United States. She was born there in 1811 and lived till 1872 to 61 years of age. All right. So kind of another longer life compared to the other women that we studied, although she did die of cancer. Um, so, you know, her life was cut shorter than it could have been had she not contracted cancer. Um, she was originally born in Maine as Sarah Willis. Okay, Fanny Fern is her pseudonym that she used as a writer. So this is interesting. This is the first instance where we have a woman using a pseudonym. Well, we also have Sojourner Truth who used a pseudonym, right? She was born Isabella Bomfrey. And I don't know if you necessarily want to call it a pseudonym, but she took a name. She renamed herself um, to get away from her, her enslaved person name, right? And she felt very called. Um, to that name by by the Holy Spirit, she says, so true truth, um, to preach the truth and become a traveler who did that. Now, Fanny Fern took this as her as her uh, writer's name or her alias, her writer's alias, um, but it's got a female name, distinctively female, right? First time we've had something distinctively female because Sojourner, don't know if that's a woman or, or a man, right? That's a, that's a traveler is what it means. Um, but Fanny Fern, that is distinctly female. So that's the first time of our female authors that we've read where somebody chose like a distinctly female pseudonym or alias. Um, Afra Bain actually, you know, often wrote under her own name. Although, you know what? Sometimes she did write under the name of Estrella. So that's also kind of more of a female name. So, so you know, we have both going on with Afra Bain. But um, Fanny Fern, yeah, she wrote under the name of Fanny Fern. Yeah. Uh, wasn't trying to obscure her female identity there. Anyway, um, as was the case with Mary Shelley, Fanny's life was marked by both immense literary success as well as dramatic personal tragedy. She was the fifth of eight children to newspaper owner Nathaniel Willis and Hannah Parker. Two of her brothers were also in journalism, uh, Richard Storrs Willis, um, who is a music journalist and composer of, hey, here's one you might know. She, He composed It Came Upon the Midnight Clear. You know the Christmas carol? It came upon a midnight clear, that glorious something, something. All right, that song, yeah, <laughs> that Christmas carol that you may know, that her brother 
wrote that. Uh, and then Nathaniel Parker Willis, so he was named after her father. She had the same name, Nathaniel Willis, as her father. Um, well, Nathaniel Parker Willis, her brother, became a journalist and magazine owner. Uh, Fanny began writing and ed editing for her father's newspapers. Remember, I told you her father um, owned papers. Uh, she then married Charles Eldridge and had three daughters with him. In 1844, however, her mother and younger sister suddenly died. And in the next year, 1845, her oldest daughter tragically drained, died of brain fever. And then her husband soon died of typhoid fever. She was left destitute. Unable to support her remaining two daughters, she turned to her family. Remember, it's still very difficult for women to find jobs. Even though Margaret Fuller was supporting herself as a journalist fully, um, still very difficult for a woman to make it in these times. Her, Even her newspaper brother, Nathaniel, who was editor of the paper, he refused her any financial help whatsoever. Her in-laws and father gave her very little monetary assistance and told her instead to remarry. Yeah. So, to salvage her own and her daughter's lives, she married a merchant named Samuel Farrington, whose jealousy ended up driving her so crazy that she scandalously left him within two years of their marriage, and he divorced her two weeks later. Yet again, having to support herself and her two daughters, Fanny started writing articles in desperation. She sent some to journalist brother Nathaniel, who not only refused them, but told her they were unmarketable anywhere but Boston. Another New York newspaper, however, published them and gave her a weekly column, which made her the very first woman to, wrote, to write a weekly newspaper column. Yeah, she became the very first news, weekly newspaper columnist that was a female. In fact, the immediate and extraordinary popularity of her newspaper column only three years into her newly born career as a newspaper columnist made her $100 a week. So, she was being paid $100 a week. She was America's most highly paid newspaper columnist, male or female at that time. Pretty amazing that she became the America's most highly paid newspaper columnist, male or female. And, and what do you know it? Her brother wouldn't even hire her and her dad wouldn't even give her much monetary assistance. Yet here she is proving her own as America's most highly paid newspaper, weekly newspaper columnist. James Parton, editor of her brother's of her brother Nathaniel's magazine, Home Journal. Remember, Nathaniel, that was the one who wouldn't hire her. Um, so this was the editor of one of her brother's magazines. He liked Fanny's writing so much that he started publishing her articles. Furious. James, uh, well, Nathaniel actually found out, and he forbade James from publishing any more of his sister Fanny's articles. Well, James Parton, the editor of the magazine, was so furious that Nathaniel was forbidding him from printing the articles of Fanny's that he loved. He resigned. He resigned as editor of the Home Journal. And he later married Fanny to boot. So those was, must have been some interesting family parties and get-togethers that they had, right? Family reunions with the man who banned Fanny's, the publication of Fanny's articles. <laughs> and then the man, James, who resigned from that magazine, published them and married Fanny. Yeah. Fanny's highly personable, conversational, and often acerbic style. So acerbic means like kind of sour or, or like sarcastic, I guess you might say sarcastic, witty and sarcastic, um, was the secret to her success. She knew her audience and wrote about subjects that would interest and or entertain them. 
many of the readers of newspapers and magazines in this time of female wealth and leisure were women. Remember we talked about how women were becoming more and more educated. And so as women became more educated and as daily chores became more mechanized because of the many inventions that were coming about during this age of industrialization, uh, women had more and more free time because they weren't having to spend as much time on um, tedious, long household chores. Um, so they had more leisure time and they also had more wealth from having things mechanized. Um, and also just, you know, mechanization just increased in their education too because um, mechanization, you know, brought efficiency and with efficiency came the greater potential for earning. Anyway, so women had more earnings either through their husbands, you know, you, I mean, especially women who were educated, it would have been typically through their husbands, but there were these exceptions like Fanny Fern, right? And Margaret Fuller. Anyway, these women who were more educated, had more leisure time and more wealth, they wanted to read more because they were educated and they could read. And so Fanny Fern tailored her articles to those female readers, you know, who were burgeoning populace. And if people weren't writing towards them, then all of a sudden Fanny Fern is slipping into a niche that was there to for uh, untaken. So she slides into that niche where we need people who are writing for the, the burgeoning women readership. Um, so she, she wrote um, according to those women's interests. She was a female columnist who appealed directly to female interest, especially a writer who aimed her themes and diction directly at these female readers. They, she wrote columns on fashion, manners, dress code laws. Yeah, believe it or not, there were dress codes back then and there were laws enforcing that. And of course, what are, who are they targeted at? Yeah, women, on what women could wear and not wear. So, you know, women very much cared about those laws. And you can imagine how Fanny Fern felt about the laws. Yeah, she was not in support of laws that were dictating what women, what women could and could not wear. Um, she also wrote about the overwhelming responsibilities of daily female life, social problems, unfaithful husbands, financial stresses, etc. I must say, I could not set down the Fanny Fern readings. I loved them, absolutely, and read every single piece of hers that our anthology contained. I don't have an assigned every single piece, but I read them all because I, I couldn't stop it. I enjoyed them so much. If you have time, try to check out some of her other highly observant, always witty and compelling Fern Leaves in our anthology. That's what she called her, her uh, column. Fern leaves, get it? Fern, meaning, you know, the plant fern and leaves, like the leaves of the plant fern. So that's what she called her, her writings, especially since the leaves of a book were, you know, the pages in a book were called, were called leaves. Um, so, so there you have that double entendre with leaves being related to a book and writings and also a fern, the plant. Um, for instance, Mrs. Adolphus, this is the title of one, Mrs. Adolphus Smith sporting the blue stocking. That piece so dead on captured a day in my life, in my own life, that I read it aloud to my husband. I enjoyed it so much. Uh, another one, moral molasses, is exactly what I taste too when I swirl the self-help guides to modern life. And another one titled, A Law More Nice Than Just, had me simultaneously laughing and wincing at 19th century law that arrested women in male apparel, the, the apparel that the story's wife so desperately needed to be able just to take a walk because women weren't allowed to take walks by themselves, especially after certain hours. The piece we read for class, Blackwell's Island Number no. 3, published in 1858, as similarly does Fern's The Working Girls of New York, that's another title, seemingly glibly yet very compassionately points out double standards and social conditions that facilitate the plight of women on the titular island, Blackwell. A refrigerator quote for me is the piece's lament to which I can all too closely relate. Quote, I can't tell what I have accomplished today, and yet I have not been idle a minute. 
unquote. I feel that every day. Like many other women of her day, Fanny, despite her immense literary success, wrote under a pseudonym. She chose it from fond memories of 